Okay, it's, it's noon. We have 24 people. Okay, welcome to the Food Security Working Group breakout session for today. My name is Josie Sam. I'm a researcher at the University of Alaska Fairbanks International Arctic Research Center. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to the discussion. The chat monitor will soon go over guidance for this meeting. So please take over from here, Krista. You're speaking, Rachel. We can't hear you. Is Krista on? Hi, Josie. Yes, I am on. Okay. Okay, I just invited you to read the instructions, Krista. Okay, well, good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome. Some logistics before we start the presentation. Uh, if you've joined, with your, you've joined with your camera off and your audio muted, if you unmute yourself at any time, please remember to re-mute after speaking. If you're calling in from the phone, uh, you can do this by pressing star six. Please keep your phone muted during the presentation and do not put us on hold. We can all hear your typing and conversations when you aren't muted and the hold button may cause disruption in the presentation. If you have the option, please use headphones or a headset. If you are on the phone, please turn your computer speakers all the way down. We can get an echo when the phone picks up your computer audio. By hovering your mouse at the bottom of the screen, you can see um, the chat and see other participants via these controls. Um, if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the chat window and they will be read out loud. If you need any assistance, you can message the moderator via the chat tool or the raise hand tool, which is accessed by opening the participant window. If you'd like to join the discussion, um, please unmute yourself and that icon is in the far left. Um, or you can ra raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you. Um, you can also send a chat message to the group um, and it will go to everyone. And um, the moderator, myself, will read the question out, out loud. Uh, for folks without mics, you can also type your um, type into the chat box and we'll read your question out loud. Uh, this presentation will be recorded. A video file um, and audio file will be available on the iAsk YouTube channel or the AOS website. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Josie. Thank you, Krista. We'll now receive the Indigenous acknowledgements from Candice. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. The Circumpolar Arctic is the contemporary home of many different Indigenous peoples. Please join me in recognizing these lands and waters as the mostly unceded traditional homelands of Indigenous peoples. Together we honor and recognize the place-based knowledge of Arctic Indigenous peoples and their ancestral and contemporary stewardship of their homelands. It is the responsibility of each of us individually to learn, read, and gain better understanding of, of the Indigenous peoples and cultures in which we engage. I am joining you today from the traditional lands of the Copper Inuit. I honor and recognize Inuit Kaumayutukangit and their ancestral and contemporary stewardship of their homelands. I welcome all of you wherever you are, to honor the Indigenous peoples and the lands of your place. Thank you, Kwana Kotit, and now I'll return the mic over to Danielle to get us started. So 
Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I think so. Um, hello, my name is Danielle Stickman. I'm, it's afternoon here in Anchorage, Alaska, and I'll just begin with um, continuing with the code of conduct. And this can be found on the website. I'll add it to the website once I've gone through a few of the key points. As we gather to discuss and share science and different knowledge bases, bases, we must remember to come with a willingness, an open mind, and foster good spirit in multiple Arctic languages so that we can create a sense of community even online. We get out what we put in and we invite all AS Alaska Science Summit, <laughs> Science Summit Week and Arctic Observing Summit Week participants to be intentional and thoughtful in their interactions. This code of conduct was based on work from many organizations, meetings, and contributions from AOS and ASSW participants. I ask is committed to providing a safe, productive, and welcoming environment for all meeting participants and staff. So I'll just go over a few of the engagement principles and guidelines. Let's value a diversity of views and opinions. Speak without judgment or argument strive for inclusive, transparent, and open communication. This is an opportunity to be curious and put aside assumptions. We also must remember to share the air. We all have something to learn and something to share. Be considerate, respectful, and collaborative in speaking and listening. And so the rest of these I'll put in the chat box and you can look over in your spare time just to remember how to interact with each other and in this online virtual space. And we must remember to be accountable when we fail to meet these guidelines. Let's work together to identify problems and adjust our approach according, accordingly. And with that, I will hand it over to, sorry, my internet is slow. I'm not sure who I hand it over to next. Hey, this is Rachel. Um, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining um, this session. And um, how this is going to work out today is that we will have um, a series of overview presentations, and then we will have a um, discussion, a facilitated discussion based on the conversation from um, yesterday and the priorities that our group has identified. And so starting um, with um, Eva Krumel, she will present an overview of the Cyan Roads process. So, Eva. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, so, yeah, my name is Eva Krumel. I work for the Inuit Sukumpula Council, and um, I'm, um, as part of that, I'm part of the uh, Cyan board and um, also involved in the um, AOS organization. And um, Josie, if, if you could share uh, Sandy's presentation, I hope that people got the chance. Um, we have um, um, we have uh, Sandy Starkweather, who is the um, Seon chair, um, who gave a presentation um, about roads and um, what we are hoping to provide input into the uh, process. And um, you're already on the right slide. That's excellent. Um, so that's the first one that I just wanted to people um, have a look at again, where um, the societal benefit areas uh, for Arctic observing um, were listed and identified. And you see that food security um, is listed as one of them. Um, the other important, um, and I think that's on the next slide, uh, Josie, if you could go one further, exactly. Um, the essential Arctic variables, um, that, that is um, another important um, structure that we should be aware of. And Josie, if you could click a few times um, until we see everything. So that's where we are trying to connect. Thank you, Josie. Um, that was one too much. <laughs> Perfect. So that's where we try to connect um, the societal benefit areas and uh, the supporting objectives to the observing system inputs. So you see the um, societal be benefit areas to the very left and the observing system inputs to the very right. And um, in, in between, you basically see um, 
components of it and um, connections between the components. So for example, we have um, products and services. Um, um, we have the essential Arctic variable, sorry, in, in, in the middle of them that we are trying to, um, to use to basically connect the very left to the very right. Um, and I think that our task is in a way to really see how can we, um, how can we, and I hope that we can, find ways to, um, um, to connect the, the view that we have in, let's say, in a f uh, food security lens to what we have right now with um, the Arctic society benefit areas identified in the SEON process, as well as um, um, the essential Arctic variables. And um, maybe another one that we would want to have a look at if you click one further, Josie. So yeah, that's, and I was actually, I think on the call, so he could even um, chime in here. Um, that was uh, one um, example um, that was published um, for candidate um, Let's say um, if we would take an essential Arctic variable that would be identified as sea ice. And um, we have the societal benefits on the very left and we have certain applications um, connected to those and then sea ice variables in the middle. And then certain observing networks on the right and data networks um, that are linked again to those. Um, so again, um, our task would be to to think about how to connect those um, those elements with each other and how um, the food security um, lens um, may fit into the process. And I, I think I well maybe let's go one slide further, Josie. I think that's I'm not sure if there was next one. Um, let's go one more. Um, okay, that's a long presentation. Could you click one more? One more. Um, and one more. One more. <laughs> Sorry. So one one way of doing it, for example, would be within the road strategy um, to have expert panels on um, specific um, topics. And you see here, um, you know, um, topics like atmosphere, biodiversity, food security, again, et cetera, um, helping to identify essential Arctic variables, um, to develop requirements for observing data and management, and all its implementation um, strategies. Um, so, and then there are um, certain groups that are filled in here and I'm not going through all of those, but um, food security you see is listed as one um, and um, us here at the Arctic Observing Summit. And Josie, if you go one more. One more. One more. One more. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there was a slight missing, but that's not important. I think um, it's it's really more to um, to think about the votes process as it was laid out in um, in Sandy's presentation, and um, for us to think about um, how and if the food security lens um, can provide input into these and um, what the different angles would be. And I, I think that um, well, we'll hear now some other presentations that will po provide the food security angle. Yes, thank you, um, Eva, for uh, stepping in there at the last minute. Um, and so I think Eva posed, you know, the, exactly the challenge that we should be thinking about as we're watching these presentations and looking at ways to connect the view that we have through a food security lens and the Arctic societal benefit areas in this process. and you know, how these could connect. And so for those of you less familiar with, you know, what a food security lens might be from our indigenous perspectives, um, Krista Haringa is going to now um, share that with you. Krista, go ahead.
Okay, and would you like me to go ahead and share my my screen? I think it will. I'm not sure if Josie, you need to um, stop sharing first. Okay. Yes, it's open now. Okay, um, and so um, I was asked just to briefly touch on um, my presentation from yesterday as well as Carolina Behes. And my name is uh, Krista Herringa and I um, serve as the coordinator for community partnerships for self-reliance housed at the International Arctic Re Research Center in Fairbanks, Alaska. That's the traditional homelands of the Tanana Dene people. Um, and so part of why I'm reviewing this today is just in case there's a few, a few of you who weren't able to um, join yesterday. Um, I'm going to do my best to review the ICC, ICC's food security conceptual frame, framework, but I also want to encourage those that were listening in on yesterday's session to add your comments in the chat box. Um, of different key messages or things that stood out to you. And then um, I'd go I'll go ahead and read those um, at, in the end. So the development of the Alaskan Inuit food security conceptual framework provides a platform for understanding the pieces that make up the Arctic ecosystem and the interconnections between the many pieces that make up food security. The ICC framework provides direction for what information is needed and how to interpret the, that information in order to assess food security. The conceptual framework is provided through an image of a drum and explains that food security is characterized by env environmental health. Environmental health is achieved with the stability of six dimensions. And those dimensions are av availability, Inuit culture, decision-making power and management, health and wellness, stability, and accessibility. Three tools support the stability of these six dimensions, and those are policy, multiple knowledge sources, and co-management. Uh, if you haven't already had the chance, uh, have, if you haven't had a chance to look at the ICC's food security framework, um, at the end of this, I'll go ahead and put a link in the chat box um, to that uh, conceptual framework. And I would def, uh, encourage all of you to take a look at it. Uh, yesterday I shared a holistic definition of food security developed in 2018 in collaboration with the Tanana Chiefs Conference Hunting, Fishing and Gathering Task Force and representatives from six indigenous interior Alaska communities, including Nulato, Kaikuk, Anvik, Initai, Ruby and Tanana. This framework was developed through sharing words and ideas that conveyed the significance of what traditional harvest practices meant to those that were gathered. And through further dialogue, we agreed on words and phrases that captured the significance of the con concept shared earlier. Twelve different components of healthy traditional harvest practices were identified through this process. Uh, in reviewing these components, I will draw some comparison with the ICC's six dimensions of food security. First, uh, the availability of wild foods and the traditional knowledge needed to effectively and appropriately harvest these foods build happy, strong families by supporting strong identities, physical wellness, and mental well being. And this concept is the most similar to the ICC's uh, food security dimension of health and wellness. Traditional knowledge, values, and sharing all embody a way of life that is sustained through spirituality rooted in strong culture. Krista? The two, oh, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt. Could, would you mind making your slides full screen? They're hard for some of us. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't Thank realize you. that. Um, just a moment. I. Having to uh, oh, 
sorry. I am um, losing a couple of things. Um, just a moment here. Are you able to go to presenter mode? Um, I just lost all of my controls. I'm so sorry about that. I don't know. Maybe if I end the show here, I can. Okay, is that, um, is that better or did I just unstop sharing my screen? I don't think you're sharing the screen right now. Okay, well, we'll try that again. Okay, is it back now or? Perfect. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry about that. All right, so um, I think I am on um, the dimension of availability and the ICC um, dimension of availability is um, most similar to these concepts of the natural grub box and full bellies. And this is uh, most conveyed through the health and well-being of and culture and how they're uh, interconnected with the abundant fish, game, and wild foods that are provided through quality habitat and healthy ecosystems. River eddies and hunting trails convey concepts of accessing this abundance, which is supported through stable environmental conditions, the cash needed to acquire the supplies used to harvest wild resources, and the legal protection to hunt and fish within traditional territories. The role of indigenous governance structures that embody stewardship of the land, insight in the interconnections between people, animals, and place was emphasized as paramount in the sustainable use of wild foods. And this is also the most similar to the ICC dimension of decision-making power and management. Uh, contributors to um, the de definition, uh, holistic definition of healthy um, traditional harvest practices in interior Alaska also emphasized the importance of indigenous influence on formal and informal forms of education as being necessary in order for future generations to acquire the knowledge and skills needed to maintain and adapt this way of life as social, economic, and environmental shifts occur. Although there are uh, differences between the food security framework developed by the ICC and interior Alaska communities, uh, they both uh, emphasize the, um, that food security means a lot more than nutritional value, calorical, caloric intake, and purchasing power. A vision of food security for indigenous people in Alaska encompass a holistic picture of ecological health and stability, practicing and transmitting a way of life to the next generation, political protection and freedom to maintain culturally based livelihoods and the freedom to select and integrate adaptations consistent with a way of life in response to current and future environmental, economic, political, and social change. Um, and I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing, um, but if there's um, anyone who had added comments into the chat box, I can go ahead and read them uh, out loud now. Um, and from Lauren Devine, yesterday I learned that it would be useful to reframe the way that the SBAs are visualized and discussed, evaluated to encourage a more connected ecosystem approach um, to make sure a more connected ecosystem approach is taken. Um, and I guess with that, um, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you, Rachel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Krista, very much um, for the presentation. And um, just a reminder to everybody, you know, we've posted a draft, a very, very draft version of our synthesis on the working group web, web page. And, you know, in there, you'll see, you know, several stories that, that um, illustrate a lot of the 
um, different um, aspects of food security that are important and how they're connected. And up next, we have um, Eva Burke, who shared one of those stories to provide um, how her story fits into the six dimensions of food security. Go ahead, um, Eva. Hi, hi, Rachel. How many minutes did you want me to spend about? There are about five minutes or so. Okay, perfect. That's what I had. Thank you. Can everyone see that? Can you see that, Rochelle? Yes, mm -hmm. we can see it. Okay. Okay, great. I'm basically giving um, half of the presentation that I did yesterday. So if it sounds familiar, it is, but I think it's good review. My name is Eva Don Burke. I am from Ninana and Manly Hot Springs along the Tanana River in the interior region of Alaska. I grew up practicing my Athabascan traditions of harvesting from the land, rivers, and lakes near the Minto Flats. I am now a graduate researcher at UAF in the Natural Resources and Environment Department, working on healing through food and culture. As Rachel mentioned, we shared some stories with you. For more in-depth version, I would encourage you to visit the website of On the Land, a media collective created to center indigenous voices and experiences on the land. Stories from myself, Juno Burselson, Corey Erickson, Sherry Fox, and Austin Moss, Austin Amasip are all for your review. Today, I will briefly revisit Indigenous Mission based on my story as it applies to the six dimensions of Inuit food sovereignty and security and the observing framework Krista just shared. Not only systems, processes, variables, input and output are important to research. Equally important are the values and relationships surrounding them. As you begin to consider what an observing framework for indigenous food sovereignty and security looks like, please account for our values and relationships around food and culture. Indigenous culture is interwoven with food sovereignty and security. Our schedule follows a seasonal lifestyle and to maintain harvesting skills, food preparation must be part of everyday life. We have reciprocal relationships with plants, animals, lands, waters, and air. Because they are our relatives, we have empathy for them and view ourselves as protectors. We honor our relatives with ceremony. For example, the tradition of giving the first catch to elders or the whaling festival, Nalukatuk, that takes place in Utkiavik every June. We only take what is needed for survival and have a zero waste policy for sustainability. We use the skins, furs, and bones for things such as regalia, art, canoes, and baskets. And state and federal policies do not account for these values and in fact are endangering our food sovereignty and security. As we move into our breakout group, I would like to cover some key points and provide some basic prompts for discussion. I organize my key points around the six dimensions of Inuit food sovereignty and security. But as you can see, many of these components overlap with what Krista just shared. So availability. My search for knowledge on factors affecting availability was not linear or one dimensional. I sought out information from several sources, elders, skilled hunters, including some non-native, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and the Yukon Department of Environment in Canada. So my question is how do we train scientists to think like we do, to seek out other knowledge sources, to validate indigenous knowledge, indigenous culture. In line with my culture, I used relationships and dialogue as well as scientific research to develop a more holistic understanding of both indigenous knowledge and Western science. So how do we inform researchers in order to develop a holistic cyclical framework for observing? Decision-making power. In my experience with the Alaska De Department of Fish and Game Board of Game, the powers that be were not receptive to indigenous knowledge and their decision-making process. I tried to communicate the importance of both sciences in my public testimony 
and I always remained open to learning. So how do we equally weight indigenous knowledge with Western science, health and wellness? As an indigenous person, I understand animal behavior and the importance of reciprocal relationships. Our systems are out of balance and there is an urgent need to monitor the environment to protect the health and safety of all living things. So how do we begin observing to protect the health and safety of lands, waters, animals, and humans? Stability. With rapid environmental changes, it is critical to include indigenous researchers as principal investigators throughout the entire research proposal process. There is limited funding and time. Efficiency and cooperation are essential. So how do we communicate this urgency to protect our natural resources? And finally, accessibility. This research can inform policymakers to change regulations to protect or enhance the environment so it can continue to support all living things, humans and animals alike. Priority must be given to feeding ourselves first. So how do we change regulations to prioritize feeding ourselves first? As researchers, we tend to gravitate towards methodologies, but when working with indigenous people, it is important to honor their knowledge, build relationships with them, and practice their values. Indigenous people have deep connections with their environment and can provide invaluable guidance to developing research proposals, programs, observing networks, co-production of knowledge, and co-management strategy. As Corey Erickson reminded me, indigenous knowledge is based on a network of observations. We are big picture thinkers. Thinkers, Our worldview is not siloed by discipline. We are inherently interdisciplinary and our survival depends on maintaining our network of observations. Ina Basit, if you have any questions, I'll take those now. Um, if not, we'll hand it over to the next I think Warren Diana, is going to cover key messages. Um, Julie Raymond Jacobian is going to now go over the key messages from our breakout session yesterday so that, you know, we can build off from the conversation that we had yesterday, you know, as we're, um, you know, looking at how, you know, we bring these different worldviews together. So, Julie, it's all yours. Hey, everybody. Julie Raymond Jacobian. I work for Coeric Incorporated, which is the Alaska Native Nonprofit Tribal Consortium for the Bering Strait region of Alaska. And as Rachel said, I just wanted to go over some of the main themes that have been coming out of this working group. And Josie, I just sent you a slide a second ago. If, if you're able to pull it up, please do. But if not, it's okay. Um, I'm just going to yeah. read through the, the high level um, themes and not get too much into the details and hopefully we can discuss a lot of this in our breakouts. <clears throat> so the first theme, oh thank you, the first theme that has come out of this working group is the need to understand food security through an indigenous lens, as well as health and wellness as a current gap in observing programs, but is also an urgent need. Another theme is that more support is needed for community driven research and monitoring. A food sovereignty approach to governance structures is imperative. To governance and structures is imperative. Additional work is needed to appropriately acknowledge and value indigenous knowledges. The importance of indigenous languages to understanding observations. And again, these are just the broad level themes. Um, another one is the importance of using a common language and understanding as well as capacity building for researchers and capacity building for indigenous peoples and communities. Another theme is the need to move forward under a new paradigm, as well as the need to design a new and equitable observing system, and a need to document and share good examples and productive examples of the kind of work we're talking about. Additionally, acknowledging that there are existing tools to help us accomplish our goals. And importantly, the need to appropriately acknowledge the contributions of indigenous peoples and organizations. And again, those are high level themes and um, we do have them 
discussed in more detail in a document that will become public soon once we're finished with it. And again, hopefully we can talk about these in our breakout groups. Thanks. Great. Um, well, yeah, and I thank you, Julie. Um, and for helping set the stage. Thank you to all of our presenters um, to share a lot of the background material. We know this was, you know, rushed, but um, we appreciate the presenters for sharing where our conversations are going to be going next. We'll be focusing on two different areas that, you know, came out of our conversations and discussions yesterday. And so I'm going to now hand it over to um, Noor and Melinda to um, talk about the two different areas that we'll be um, addressing today. Great. Um, thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Noor Johnson. I'm a research scientist with the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And I'm um, sitting today in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is why it's, I'm greeting you with a good afternoon. Um, so what the plan for the next hour, a little bit less than an hour, is to have two breakout groups. And what the, the working group organizing team has done is to look back through the themes that were covered yesterday that Julie just summarized um, and to kind of pull out some real priority themes that, that would benefit from more discussion and that we can think about in the context of the roads framework that Eva presented a little bit earlier, um, as well as thinking about um, in terms of some of the, the key messages that we wanna bring forward as we're working on this summary document. So Melinda, do you wanna talk a little bit about the themes you'll be um, discussing in your group, and then I'll introduce the themes that Eva, Don, uh, Eva Burke and I will be talking about in, in our group. Yes, that works out. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Adet, that means hello in my home language. Uh, uh, Deganog, which um, is from the village of Anvik. Um, it's a traditional name is Gitrinath Chag. That means the mouth of the long, long river. It's at the lower uh, middle Yukon um, here in Alaska. And so I'm happy to be here and to help facilitate this next uh, breakout session um, with all of you. I think we've done some pretty, um, pretty um, astounding work over line, online um, under you know, some stressful situations for people over the last couple of days. Um, but in terms of uh, looking at the, the uh, roads uh, framework that was presented um, a short while ago, um, real briefly, and then as well as the uh, the um, indigenous uh, framework that Krista um, uh, reviewed with us. What we'll be doing in the uh, group that I'm helping to facilitate, um, we'll be looking at the um, areas of health, wellness, governance, management, policy, and reciprocity. Um, that's a huge uh, that's a huge chunk to take off. So I think uh, we do have four guiding questions and those really come from some of the questions that uh, Eva posed in, um, in, in that last uh, round of uh, presentation that she gave. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I know that's a lot to uh, take, take on, but we will um, do the best we can, which we are doing um, during this week uh, to have this kind of conversation and move it forward, so. In. Thank you. So um, Melinda's group is, is going to be breakout group one, and then Eva Burke and I will be facilitating breakout group two. And the themes that we will be talking about in our group are the, the theme of the language and the terminology that we use when we talk about community um, observing. So um, community-based, observing versus community driven observing and why um, language might matter might make a difference to building a community a global community of practice we're going to talk about monitoring variables and who who shapes and determines those variables um, we're going to talk about capacity building and um, talk about that in a couple of ways one is to think about the role of youth and how to deepen 
um, and broaden the role of youth in community observing. And then we also are going to talk about capacity building of, of uh, Western trained scientists and how to help um, science understand an Indigenous perspective and, and an Indigenous worldview in a much deeper way. So um, can someone help us in terms of giving directions to people about how to join the different groups? Of course. So thank you everyone for working with us here as we transition to sort of an online format. Appreciate your patience. Uh, we'll be breaking out into two different breakout groups, exactly as Nora and Melinda talked about. Um, if you're interested in taking part in the group discussion for the first breakout group, we ask that you rename yourself and put a one in front of your name. Um, if you are interested in taking part in the, this, the discussion of the second breakout group, we ask that you put a two, a number two, instead of your name, uh, in front of your name instead. Um, and how you do this is if you are uh, your sort of um, picture, your name has a yellow um, sort of uh, background, yellow uh, uh, square around it. And if you go into the three dots and tap that and go down the menu and hit rename, you can go ahead and put a number um, and type that in front of your group. Um, and of course, a quick recap of the two groups. Uh, breakout group one is will be co-facilitated by Melinda Chase, Lauren Devine, and Kari Erickson, and it will be about health, wellness, governance, management, policy, and reciprocity. Uh, the second breakout group will be co-facilitated by Noor Johnson and Eva Burke, and it will be um, focus on community-based versus driven, um, language, terminology, monitoring variables, capacity building, um, and so on in the, that line. Um, and if anyone is calling in from a telephone and doesn't have the option to change their name or has any questions or is otherwise unsure, please stay right here. Uh, once I move most people over, I can work on you one-on-one -on -one just to make sure you get in the right group there. Um, and yeah, we'll go ahead and start shifting folks. It'll probably take just a minute or two. Um, the three dots are is if you hover over your, uh, your box with your name in it, um, it should appear next to a mute button in blue. And if you then click on those dots, you should have the option to rename yourself. So real quick, let's go ahead and add everybody in one. And I will, uh, we have about 45 minutes or so. I will send a five minute warning um, once everyone is uh, set there. Perfect. Let's see. Okay, if anyone left is having uh, any sort of troubles or if anyone is unsure, please let me know.
Oh, Victoria, of course. Uh, let me go ahead and make sure you end up there. Oh, of course, not not a problem, Daniel. Let's see, you're one. Uh, Victoria. Tatiana, okay. Let's see, let me move you back into one where you should be here. And Victoria, you should have a little um, message box should pop up telling you that you are um, invited to group two. Okay, Victoria, let me, uh, let me redo that real quick. So you can ignore that one while well, that one was for one. And then let's go ahead and let's put that to two. And let me know if you see anything now. Mm hmm. Okay. Mm hmm. Yes, Tatiana, we're, you should have an invite back to group two. Okay. That's okay, not a problem. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts, let's see. And Victoria, um, let's see, I will make you a temporary co-host. Can you share your screen for me and show me what you see? Okay, can you click on the Zoom icon? Yes, can you click on meeting controls? Uh -huh. Okay, never mind. Can you go back to the main Zoom uh, menu there? and click on, um, I'm sorry, can you hover back over the Zoom icon in your taskbar? And then click on, let's see. Where are you joined through? Uh -huh. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, let's see if you can try to join a meeting. No, it's not, sorry, I turned on my audio. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Um, why don't, can you try to leave this meeting and come back? Would that be okay? Yes, I will be okay. right back. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, perfect. And Victoria, if you can hear me, which group would you like to go into? Sorry, I would like to go to the second one. The second one, okay, perfect. Well, let's go ahead and put you in there. Okay. Thank you. I can yeah. see it. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Thank you. Wait for a few moments for people to get back into the session, huh? Thank you, Melinda, for facilitating a great breakout group. <laughs> ah, well, that was my first, so I hope everybody bared with me on that one. Um, hey, Nora, that was really clever to ask me if I'd do it, and then just like one second before the group ended. Um, <laughs> did did I, you like that I, trick? I, that was super cool, but I, I'm happy to summarize. If the if the three youth also help with this summary. That sounds great to me. Thank you.
So just to clarify, I don't count as youth, right? You're the you're the most youthful dude ever. But um, yeah, you, I, I think by asking that question, you've just like like checked yourself out. Yeah, I think I'm well beyond that stage. And Shelly, Serafima has volunteered to help. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, maybe we're ready to report. Maybe we could go first. We could invert the order and number two. Working group oh, okay, two could go that. first. Yeah. <laughs> Does that sound okay, Shelly? And Sarah Fima? Um, sure. Were you going to address the language issue first and then get into the the youth side? Or how how do you want to do this? I think that would be helpful. I could just begin by saying that we had a, um, we, we made a sort of miscalculation from the facilitator and organizer perspective and that we had too many questions and we didn't have time to address all of them. So we actually um, only talked about the first two questions. The first one was about language and terminology and the second one was about youth. Um, and Shelly, you had a really helpful characterization of the different ways we talked about language. So if you'd be willing to share that. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, you know, when, when people jumped in and, and started answering, you, you could tell that the things that, that people hold really close to their hearts include, obviously, including Indigenous language. Um, you know, I think we all recognize that there's a huge failure across the system to, to allow that to be used. Um, and then uh, Candace brought up the fact that, you know, for, for many Indigenous researchers, especially people that are, that are in the communities, English is often a second language. So the amount of jargon, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but even in these, these breakout rooms, I've seen um, conversations somewhat go down a path that would be really difficult to follow if you're not, um, I, I guess, in that world all the time. Uh, and there's nothing worse than feeling stupid. So I think the the idea of of having communication, and I, and I hate when people say dumb it down because there's nothing dumb about being clear, but having language that's clear, accessible, makes people engaged is is the other side of it. And then I think the third part is that there's the decolonization of of language around research, and that's you know the the reason I threw out that that example of the fact that we don't use community-based monitoring anymore because too many people from the South have, have sort of hijacked that term and made it about having a temporary presence in a community and then saying, look at us, we're community-based. And the community is like, I have no idea who you are. So we prefer community-driven to really give the power back to the people who, who should be in the driver's seat. And that's, that's really the, the people that are being most affected. Great. That's a, thank you. That's a help, really helpful summary of some of the different things that we talked about in that first part of our discussion. Um, so maybe you could then do an equally helpful summary of our discussion about youth and Sarah, if you can help. Sure. I'll, I'll try to be helpful. I'm, I'm kind <laughs> of like super caffeinated right now. So like, I'll see how many words I can fit into a very short space of time. Uh, so I work with youth. And the reality is youth involvement in research has, I, I think the big failure has been that everybody wants to sort of tick a box and have a couple of youth participants, rather than really shifting the way that that research is thought about. And when you look at the fact that statistically speaking, like in, in Nunavut, as an example, 60% of the population is under the age of 30. That when you're talking about community driven research, there's no good reason that youth shouldn't be in the position to set community priorities, learn the transferable skills of acting on those priorities, and really creating community-driven research that, that youth are in this amazing ability to, to facilitate. Um, you know, in our program, we, we, um, we're really, really fond of telling the youth that number one, they are descendants of the Arctic's original scientists. 
the reason that they're there is because their ancestors learned how to to observe and monitor and test and you know everything that researchers do is exactly what their ancestors have always done so you know by default they are the descendants of, of, of Arctic scientists. And so when you put the power into the hands of those young Arctic scientists and ask them how they would prioritize and act on, on community needs, I think it's you create this amazing opportunity for Arctic excellence. And I, I think that's where personally the biggest struggle is for me is that is that people have been sort of pushing youth off into these very support positions. You know, like I'll teach you how to collect some data, but youth are not being involved in determining research questions, determining the priorities. Um, how do you interpret that data? What does it mean and how do you communicate it back to your communities? And so when you are able to give youth the time and space to become community driven researchers, just amazingly fantastic things happen. And, and that's where real Arctic excellence can be born. Ta -da. That was that was very helpful, and um, I think you always have such a clear kind of perspective that's informed by the work that you do. I think, um, and and the, the breadth of the work that you do. So thank you very much, Seraphine. But everyone, I know look, you... Lauren's baby is there. Look at Lauren's baby. <laughs> Speaking of youth, here we have one. <laughs> Serafima, I don't know if you're on still, and if you um, do you have a few, would you be willing to make a few comments about our conversation about youth? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll just go ahead and kind of say what I what I said while we were in our group, um, coming from a youth perspective, and I can only speak for myself. Um, and I've Definitely got to give a lot of credit to Lauren. She pushes me to do anything and everything that I've been open to her about not feeling comfortable because of being a youth and feeling like I don't meet standards or I'm up to par. Um, Lauren and a lot of our elders here in St. Paul have been great in uh, backing me up and encouraging me to push myself further. So that's been great. Um, but as a youth coming into um, all these different committees, groups, meetings, working groups, et cetera, for me can be intimidating. Um, being a youth and feeling like I might not have enough to share with the group, but What's been encouraging is the support in every group I've come into and encouragement to find my voice. Um, so that's been really great. And in these last two days in these working groups have been super encouraging and knowledgeable and just overall a really great experience and um, definitely getting me excited for uh, future and what's going to come out of the groups. Great. Thank you, Serafima. That was excellent. I think it's time to hand it over to Melinda's group. Um, I just want to say if anyone from group two has has a few more points to raise, please, please help us out uh, by putting them in the chat box, sort of any key messages you think we should highlight. And I thank you, Dogaden, um, for especially for all of those who contributed from uh, group number one and I mean group number two. So group number one, if you can also um, put your uh, comments in the chat box, but I, I did ask Lauren to summarize. Uh, because I'm not somebody who can write and facilitate at the same time. So, and she did help uh, co-facilitate and as well as um, Corey. So, uh, Lauren. All right, thank you. And apologies if you hear my little um, assistant over here. 
sometimes he gets loud. So um, our group was the same way. We, we only addressed a, a couple of the, well, a few of the questions. I think we got maybe around to four, but really the point of the conversation was to take our, um, you know, broader categories and really talk through how everything is connected. And some of the um, big key messages that came out around um, health, wellness, governance, management, um, human health concerns are linked to animal health. And Rosemary provided us um, a, a really, you know, concise story about how we need connected observations that include human health um, and, and people's connection to the health impacts from animals. Um, you know, a, a framework that allows observations to occur and be uh, decided on by indigenous peoples is going to be something that is whole and, and holistic that does look at those types of relationships between people, environment, animals, plants, um, kind of all of the different pieces. And what we're gonna get out of the end of something like that is a whole ecosystem observing network where um, you are, not just looking at one or two or a few things within an ecosystem, but you're looking at the whole and getting the pieces that you need out of that. Um, you know, the, the need for reciprocity and this idea of reciprocal relationships is very connected to um, the need for us to uh, identify and encourage researchers to become allies of indigenous peoples, to talk to policymakers. Sam shared, um, you know, the need to gather stories and how stories are very powerful to policymakers that are often disconnected from uh, the community level and, and the local level and um, creating those political allies through the storytelling and data, which together tell a powerful story. Um, whereas data are needed for communities to make decisions and often data do not come back to communities as we all know, but together data and stories tell indigenous perspectives better, tell a more holistic tale and can be much more informative in observing and making decisions. And so this idea of a different framework than, than what we've been kind of operating in, in trying to pick out pieces that are most important. Um, Car Corey noted that um, we're fighting David and David versus Goliath, where indigenous peoples are a small piece of fighting a large fishing industry, um, oil and gas industry. Um, he gave a couple of really good examples that I typed out. Uh, state lands, federal lands, um, these, these Goliaths, these big giants um, that we have to decide what fights we're gonna take up and what we're not. And that's just, such a backwards way of thinking, um, because if it were just allowed, if we were allowing our indigenous experts to frame the observing system in a way that takes care of people, takes care of health and wellness, um, you're naturally going to get the information that you need out of that. Um, and I thought that that was really powerful, but that was certainly not all that we covered. Um, so if anyone else would like to add, no, that's, that's not what we talked about. Uh, I'll leave it there. Anybody else would like to add to that? I just wanted to say uh, thank you all for that. I also think that if we really understand our risk from our community and we set up the markers to identify our numbers and build in the process with the permit process around us, that we can change continuing business as usual and get the reaction to protect human health in the lands and waters we depend upon to feed our families. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I do think that um, I think it was uh, um, I don't know if it was Andre, one of our other uh, one of our other um, breakout group members brought up the point of really aligning to um, to shift towards uh, working with funders that that are allies with the Western sciences. We need to definitely in this framework um, look at shifting um, how funders um, uh, look at equity 
um, when, when they're um, funding a project. And so I think we need to have some more work on that or room in that. Um, the other piece that adds to, I think, what Lauren summarized and then in Rosemary's comments also, um, it made me think of, you know, in the, in the National Climate Assessment 4, um, there's a visual in one of the chapters about complex systems, right? So um, I, this, is, this is not going away for the Arctic, the issues that we're talking about, right? And, and as, the, as, the, as the land gets warmer and opens up more and more, and of course, development and industry is looking at, continues to look at that, um, there's a visual in there looking at that being, you know, the complex decision making that we're in, and, and we know that but realizing that the monitoring system has to take in this holistic view of us and the natural world, but also the imposed development that is um, forthcoming and looking at those issues that Corey brought up, you know, state and federal lands and how those impact us. Um, you know, what can be monitored around the decision-making that happens in that space. So I guess I just wanted to add to that from, um, listening to that summary. Can I, can I jump in just for a sec, Melinda? Yes. So kind of piggybacking on the comments we made yesterday as well about how we're all, you know, we're all dealing with a lot of similar issues across the Arctic, but we all have to deal with them in very specific ways. As a, we talked a lot about Rosemary's uh, example, and that just totally highlights this, that we are each fighting like, like what um, Lauren mentioned, you know, the David and Glass, we are fighting giants in each of our, each and every one of these um, situations. And a lot of times it comes down to, you know, the industry policymakers are, you know, they tied to the industries. Um, but where do scientists fit into all this and where do observers fit into it? You know, it's, um, we're gonna have similar enemies, but the problem a lot of times, so it's not necessarily all on the scientists. It's, I think it's a lot, a lot of it is on, on utilizing that science because so much science gets put onto the shelf. So um, how do we fight these giants that we're all individually dealing with? Uh, we're gonna have to really team up together on this and it's not me versus you thing. It's uh, we're all actually fighting the same same issues, I think so. This is really good that we're all getting on the same page here because, you know, believe it or not, I, I think a lot of it is going to follow on the research institutions as well to train their modelers and their scientists and their observers to be ready for some of the social aspect of it. You know, natural sciences lack, lack a lot of that. Social scientists are trained extensively in that field, in those fields, and natural scientists aren't. Believe it or not, there are ice modelers out there that who have never seen a piece of ice before. So we have to start training at our research institutions to be ready for this incorporation of um, some of this, you know, social science type data, I guess is what scientists would think of it. But um, it comes down to the training. Once you get that indoctrinized, it's hard to go back and break the mold. Great. Thank you, Corey. Good conversation. Is there anybody else from uh, group number one that wants to uh, to add any other points? Anybody else from the whole group? All right. Well, if there's this not Eva, I just wanted to echo Corey. Sorry, Melinda. I just really want to echo what Corey just said and really draw attention to that. Like, I don't even need to add words. Just want to second that with strong emotion. <laughs> and some emojis in that chat box. <laughs> uh, I could just say also that uh, I think the process that Corey is talking about is going to be happening and is already happening. And I think. Uh, Again, the, it's a burden on the funding agencies and institutions to institute that and, and, and promote it. And it's a burden on Western scientists to, to make sure that uh, everyone is prepared for this kind of work. So I think that's, uh, that's why we have, we have to work together and listen and, uh, and 
implement it. So, so thanks. Thank you. And uh, maybe we can put into that the management institute, international management institutions that we are all uh, ma uh, managing our, the use of our living resources from. They also need to restructure uh, the way they are giving a quotas, for instance, International Whaling Commission, North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission, and all those different things that are basing their uh, quotas solely on scientific, Western scientific uh, uh, work. Mm. Mm-hmm. So thinking about that coordination and that um, and how critical that is in terms of the coordination, but then the 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 our our view within that that broader coordination and I guess really being strategic of how that happens when we're looking at creating that. So that's my thoughts. All right, well, we've definitely gone over from what I can see, but uh, again, critical conversation. And uh, uh, Nor, did you want to add anything or anybody else before we close here? Oh, and this is Nikush. I just wanted to remind somebody who has host um, functions to download the chat. I got that, Nikush. But okay, thank you. Do it too, just in case. This is Eva Don. If, if someone you. could, if sorry, if someone from every uh, breakout group could do that and capture the entirety of the chat, because if you're not in a group, you can't save the whole chat. That'd be fantastic. Can can someone tell us how to do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so oh, sure. you uh, see those. Go ahead, Kuba. Oh, sure. So if uh, if you have co-host abilities, which um, the facilitators should have, if you open up the chat window uh, yeah. where you can type messages, uh, right now it should be a blue to everybody. There's a, a series of three dots on the right side of that window. Mm -hmm. oh, if you hit that and save, save chat. chat. Yeah. Okay. Great. Got it. All right. Thanks, Nikush. I'll send you the chat. Hey, right, uh, thanks everyone. I see lots of people signing off. It was a great discussion. Thank you. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>